So hello students, welcome to the lecture two of sexual reproduction in flowering plants. In today's class, we are going to cover palynology, that is the study of pollen grains, structure of ovule and development of ovule. So in the last class, we had finished at microsporogenesis. Microsporogenesis, you should remember that diploid microspore mother cell undergoes meiosis to form microspores in the form of tetrads. This process is known as microsporogenesis and we had studied about isobilateral tetrad and tetrahedral tetrad. So now we're just quickly going to delve into that in a bit detail and then proceed with palynology. So here we have, so uh, microsporogenesis is of two types. Okay, so uh, microsporogenesis, we have two types of microsporogenesis. One is the successive type, another is the simultaneous type. Okay, successive type, another one is the simultaneous type. So starting with the successive type, this one is the more advanced type. Okay, you have to remember this. So this one is the more advanced type. What happens in this? Uh, let's just try to understand it with the help of diagram. Okay, so this is the microspore mother cell. Okay, so it undergoes division like this. Then it undergoes division like this. Then it undergoes division like this. And then it undergoes division like this. One, two, three, four, and this. This is the successive. Okay. So let's just make it a bit clear. So this one's better. Okay. So what we are observing here, this is first karyokinesis, followed by first cytokinesis, then is the second karyokinesis, and then followed by the second cytokinesis. So total, we are getting this form of tetrad. This is known as a successive type of microsporogenesis. And uh, it leads to formation of, as you can, uh, as you can observe, formation of isobilateral tetrad. Isobilateral. Bil I'm just writing T for tetrad. Okay. And it is observed in case of monocots. Okay. So it's mostly found in monocots. Uh, quite easy and quite self-explanatory, I would say. Next is the simultaneous type. So in simultaneous step, what happens? In the successive step, we observe that first karyokinesis 1, it is followed by cytokinesis 1. So now in the simultaneous step, we'll observe karyokinesis 1, karyokinesis 2, cytokinesis 1, cytokinesis 2. So the diagram would look like first is karyokinesis 1, next is karyokinesis 2, followed by cytokinesis 1, followed by cytokinesis 2. So see, you can clearly spot the differences. The final tetrad which is being formed in case of simultaneous type, it is isobilateral tetrad. No. Isobilateral tetrad is formed in case of successive type. In this case, we are going to observe tetrahedral tetrad. Okay, that's the difference. You have to keep that in mind. That's why I specifically mark this. Okay. In simultaneous type, we observe tetrahedral tetrad. In successive type, we observe isobilateral tetrad. Successive type is mostly found in monocots. Simultaneous type is mostly found in dicots. Okay, so I'm just writing it in here leads to formation formation of tetrahedral for tetrad okay so i think this part is not visible so just okay it is observed in mostly dicots okay so in case the difference comes up successive type in monocots simultaneous type mostly in dicots Successive type leads to the formation of isobilateral tetrad. Simultaneous type leads to the formation of tetrahedral tetrad. Okay, and you can observe the, the difference in the processes in successive type, karyokinesis 1, cytokinesis 1, karyokinesis 2, cytokinesis 2. And simultaneous type, karyokinesis 1, karyokinesis 2, cytokinesis 1, cytokinesis 2. Okay, so this part is completed and now we are going to uh, proceed to palynology. So what is palynology? That is the first question. So it is a study about pollen grains. Okay. So now here we are going to study about the structure of pollen grains, how they are formed and no, we are not going to study how they are transferred in this. We are going to study about this in pollination. We are just going to get up to the stage just prior to it being pollinated. Okay. We are going to study about the structure. We are going to study about all the different characters that it has, the different kinds of studies that we conduct based on uh, some properties of pollen grains. We are going to get to know about that. So first we are coming to structure of pollen grain. So the first highlight is the structure of pollen grain. 
this is a very interesting as well as a pretty scoring topic guys so i want each and every one of you to focus very nicely and do for do continue reading the ncrt whatever notes i'm giving whatever i'm discussing in the class the primary basis the backbone is always ncrt so continue reading ncrt with utmost attention and if you follow if you read the ncrt do the questions as and follow the lecture slides i think it's going to be sufficient for you guys okay uh, so coming back to study of pollen grains so start the structure of pollen grains we can divide it into three parts first is the inner pollen that constitutes the nucleus and the cytoplasm okay followed by what we have is the germ pore and next is the pollen wall so we have a name for this pollen wall is also known as sporodome okay so dome means wall so from there you can get it it's exine and entine you must have heard of it exine and entine and then exine again we observe sexine and exine sexine and next zine so sexine is the outer layer and next zine is the inner layer so now once i draw the diagram it's going to be more clear for you about the structure so first we have do we have enough space here i guess okay let's just erase this so I, let me write it like this six sign and next sign uh next pardon next sign six sign is the outer and next sign is the inner okay so let me draw the structure Okay, so I think this is this is getting a bit broader. So uh, this much words would do. I would suggest that while you are watching the lecture, continue drawing the diagram along with me, so that would uh, act as a practice for you guys as well. Okay, so uh, you can clearly understand this is the nucleus, this is the cytoplasm. So this particular part consists of the inner pollen. Okay, so this is the nucleus. I'm writing as it as okay. Let me write in complete. Nucleus is the cytoplasm, and the together constitute the inner pollen. Okay, followed by this. This is the plasma membrane. Okay, I think it has become too much thick. It won't be that much thick. Okay, this is the uh, plasma membrane. It won't be that much thick. You can just reduce thickness while you draw it on your copies. So the next is let me draw the. So I'm drawing each of the different layers with separate colors so that it's easier for you guys to understand. Okay, so now about the labeling. This layer which I've marked in red, this is the in time. Okay. The layer which I have marked in yellow is inner, that is nexine. And the layer marked in black is the sexine. And the together constitute what is known as the exine. And here you can observe this discontinuity. See, uh, just take note of this. The entire layer is continuous. Okay, the entire layer is continuous. But if we observe uh, our exine layer, it's discontinuous. Okay, so see here you observe a gap. Here you observe a gap, and here also you observe a gap. These are essentially the germ pores. So this is this happened with the germ pore. Okay, this is the sexine. This is the nexine. The together constitute the exine. The red one is the entine in uh, towards the interior is the plasma membrane and it's uh, is the inner pollen. Okay, uh, I think it's clear. I would suggest do draw this in your own copy with your own hands and that would act as uh, that would be a great help. Okay, it would help uh, like you require to practice your diagram if not for need but for your board exams you would require to draw the diagram so you require good practice of the same. Okay, so some uh, important points about pollen grains. The pollen grains they represent the male gametophyte. Okay, male gametophyte. So uh, I would suggest you make a separate chart of this. Like pollen grains represent male gametophyte, fused microsporangium they represent the pollen sac. Like this, make a chart. What this gamet male gametophyte, this female gametophyte, this microsporangium, this megasporangium, this. Okay, so make a chart of the same. Uh, I will uh, I will try so that I can send you the notes, but you should also try to make notes with your own hands. Okay. Uh, so pollen grains they represent the male gametophyte about the structure, they are spherical. 
have and around 25 to 50 microns diameter. The exine layer, they're made up of sporopollenin, as I already mentioned. Exine made up of sporopollenin. You should remember that in the previous class, I had said that the tapetal cells, the cells of the tapetum layer, they produce sporopollenin. Sporopollenin is the most resistive material yet to be found. Okay, no acid, no alkali, no enzyme, no high temperature can degrade it. So that's why even in the fossils of plants, we observe the pollen grain to be intact because of this sporopollenin, which is present in the exine layer. Okay. So next is the outer exine, outer exine layer, which is the sexine. Okay. The sexine layer is highly ornamented. So uh, what is exactly or what does exactly ornamented mean? So you observe different patterns. Okay, so to so see here I've drawn a pretty flat layer, but actually it is some kind of present like you can maybe observe something like this. Okay, so such kind of different designs and so different ornamentations are observed in the sexine layer. And because of that, this outer layer sexine is of taxonomic significance. So they play an extensive role in taxonomical studies because of the high level of ornamentation present in them. Which layer? Sexine. That is outer exine layer. So the next is uh, exine layer is discontinuous. As I already mentioned, in time is continuous layer. Exine is discontinuous layer. Discontinuous layer and interrupted by jumpo. I've just discussed this quite a few while ago. Okay. In time layer is continuous and made up of pectin, pectin and cellulose. So you ought to remember the constituents of each and every layer. Like there is in, uh, for, okay, let me just mark it with red. So this in time layer, this is composed of pectin and cellulose. Exine layer is composed of sporopollenin. Okay. Intine layer is continuous. Exine layer is discontinuous. Okay. Exine layer is uh, like it is discontinuous and is interpreted by the jumpo. We will learn about the significance of jumpo in quite a few while. And okay, so this is it. Next move to the next slide. Jumpo, also known as aperture, okay, is a small area through which the inner content of the pollen comes out. So now what does this signify? So you, I think you guys have a basic idea about pollination. We might have just read about in class 9 and 10. So what is pollination? It is a transfer of pollen grains from anther to stigma, right? So now once the pollen has landed on the stigma, there's some kind of chemical reaction between the stigmatic surface and the pollen grain. We're going to study about it. Okay. Uh, so there's some kind of chemical dialogue between them. And once the plant, like the female plant, it allows the uh, pollen grain. So what happens that the inner content of the pollen, they start getting like through the stigma cell and then to the ovary. Okay. So they start penetrating. Okay. And now this inner content of the pollen, they come out from the pollen grain, like in the form, with, in the form of pollen tube and stuff. And they, they come out through this germ pore. So you have to remember that this exine layer that is made up of sporopollenin. So under any condition, you cannot break through exine layer. Okay. You can break through entire layer, but you cannot break through exine layer because it's sporopollenin. So that's why these germ pore are present. So the, uh, so the inner content of the pollen, they get out through this uh, germ pore. And thereafter, what happens that we'll study in uh, quite a few while, we we'll started pollina uh, pollination, outbreeding devices, pollen pistol interaction. There are a lot to study, but I'm just giving a basic idea of what happens. Okay. And sporopollenin present in exine, absent in jumpo and in tank. So that's why you can understand why the inner content of the pollen in the form of pollen to come out to the jump pore only because sporopollenin is not there. You cannot degrade sporopollenin. Okay. So next is hmm. on the basis of the shape of the 
जर्म पो ओके पोलन ग्रेन आर ऑफ टू टाइप्स सो पोलन ग्रेन यू कैन क्लासीफाई दम इन टू टू टाइप्स वन टू वट इज अल्पेट कॉलपेट Pollen, uh, PG, PG stands for pollen grain. Okay, and next is the porate pollen grain. So, what does colpate pollen grain mean? Uh, so, uh, clearly, I've mentioned that the dif this particular differentiation has been done on the basis of the shape of the germ pore. So, if you observe this spindle-like shape of the germ pore, then this is known as the colpate germ pore. Okay, so we observe a spindle-like aperture. Which is known as colpa, and such pollen grains known as colpate pollen grains. But and you, if you if you observe the pore, this kind of pore-like structure, this is pore structure, pore-like structure, whatever. This is known as a porate pollen grain. Okay, it is observed in case of dicots, and this is observed in case of monocots. So a very minute difference. Okay, uh, but in porate, you observe the A uh, germ pore is kind of shaped like a pore, and culprit you find a kind of spindle-like of shape. Okay, so I think we are good to go. Next, we are coming to the next aspect of palynology. So up to here, we have covered the structure of pollen grains. We have studied about exine, entine. Thereafter, the inner content of the pollen. We have studied about its constituents, pectin and cellulose. The constituent constitute the entine, and sporopollen constitute the exine, and that's why exine is a Very very hard sub uh, pertain to any resistance or okay, any sort of uh, external factors like temperature, acid, alkali, enzymes. Due to the presence of polypollen, exine is not going to be degraded by any of these. So for the inner end of the pollen to come out, we have germ pores present. Okay, which is also known as aperture. Based on aper the shape of the aperture, we have divided pollen into colpate and porate type. So. Uh, I would say that you guys just go through the NCERT once regarding this. The pollen grains are generally spherical, two to three micrometers, hard outer exine, spore pollen, germ pore. Yeah, I've mentioned all of this. Okay, so we are good to go. So now we are coming to a different aspect of palynology. Palynology. Let's just uh, start with aero palynology. So we can clearly understand from the term itself. Aero means air, and palynology means the study of pollen grains. So There's going to be something related to this, right? So what is it? Study of pollen grains present in air. Like you can kind of derive it from the word itself, right? Study of pollen grains present in air. Okay. So the next, uh, so it deals with aero allergens. So I think you guys might have experienced like some people when they get out in, for example, you can say a garden. Okay, they start sneezing. They start so allergic responses because pollen grains cause bronchial infection, asthma, and some people are allergic to them. Okay, so these pollen grains they can cause bronchial infection, asthma. Hay fever, etc. So in aerial palynology, we study about this. Like uh, we consider a particular species, we collect the pollen grains, we observe that in which group of people they are causing this allergy. What are the symptoms? So aerial palynology de deals with all of this. Okay. So here are some examples of plants which cause pollen allergy. First example is. Okay, it's parthenium. Uh, friends, I would suggest that you guys should remember the scientific name as well as a generic name. Okay, so parthenium species. This is a scientific name, parthenium genus, and its common name or generic name is carrot grass. Okay. Next is chenopodium, and the third one is amaranthus viridis. Okay, it's n. It's not m. Um, uh, ranthus viridis. Okay. Next is Melisopanil palynology. Because you don't need to get scared of the term. I'm just going to explain it. It's very easy. 
So all is all the things you essentially know. You essentially know what happens. I'm just not trying to arrange all this information in a very organized manner so that it's easier in the facts. Okay. So we observed in error analogy. We are studying about the pollen grains that cause allergic responses in people. Okay, it can cause bronchial infection, cough, sneezing, fever, hay fever. So examples of plants whose pollen causes such allergy. We observed amaranthus viridis. Then we observed carrot grass, parthenium. And also we observed chenopodium. Okay. So it's parthenium, chenopodium, and amaranthus. So next we come to melisopalinology. It is study of pollen grains present in honey. So now uh, you might just think like, how did pollen grains be present in honey, right? So honeybees produce honey, right? And you must know that honeybees are an excellent insect pollinators. Okay. So like when they're sitting on a particular flower to derive nectar. Okay. So the pollen grains stick on the body surface and now they're getting back to the hive. They're producing honeybee. Uh, sorry. They're producing honey. Okay. The worker honeybees, they're producing honey. So like the pollen is on the surface, we can find these pollens in this particular honey that we are obtaining. Okay, so the study of this is in this municipal analogy. And what is its importance? First is purity of honey. And next is source of honey. So if, uh, for example, we have, for example, a jar of honey. Okay, and we are observing pollen grains in it. Okay, what we can do is we can collect the pollen grains and study that this pollen grain has been derived from which particular flower of which particular plant. Okay. So, so that means that particular, that particular worker, we had gone to that particular flower to collect the nectar where its pollen had stuck on its surface. So we can uh, do the respective studies. And again, presence of pollen grains in a sample of honey indicates the purity of that sample. Okay. Like, uh, I can draw a reference where example, you are having peas. Okay. But in, so like for example in one or two of the pieces you observe some insects in it okay it indicates that no chemical substances no external chemical influence has been applied so it's fresh and suitable for consumption otherwise if you apply insecticides pesticides in a amount that is not permitted okay you have to know that all these chemical substances that are used they have a certain limit up to which the use of these substances are allowed Beyond that, it's uh, it is harmful for the human beings. Okay, so if you are having, for example, peas, and you observe that in either one or two of them, you observe insect, insects are there. That means that that particular bunch of peas that you have collected, they are fresh. Okay, and it's fit for consumption. There's a reference you can draw. Next is archipelagology. So as the name suggests, and I already mentioned, due to sporopollen present in the exine layer, pollen grains do not get destroyed, and so it is a great significance in archaeological studies in the study of fossils so it comes under study of pollen grains present in the fossils importance evolutionary studies next which is deals with the use of pollen grains as food supplements, bee pollen. These bee pollen, they are rich in nutrients. Okay, these pollen grains have high nutrient content. And we have athletes consume pollen grains in the form of tablets as food supplements. Okay. So uh, up to this, we have had studied the different aspects of palynology. We started about aeropalynology. We are dealing about the pollen grains which are present in air. They act as allergens. They act as aeroallergens from uh, plants like Amaranthus viridis, Parthenium. Okay. Uh, the pollens of these particular plants, they cause allergic responses Next, we study about melisopalinology, where we are getting studying about the pollen is present in honey. We get to know two things from this. First is the purity of the sample, and second is the source of the honey. And third, we study about archipelagology, that is the study of pollen is present in fossil, and it helps in the evolutionary study. And in the last, we studied about bee pollen, which is the use of pollen grains as food supplements because of its high nutrient content. 
So the next we are coming of Poland viability. Oh yeah, I think it will fit in here. Poland viability. So it is the period of time. So it is the period of time for which the pollen grains remain viable upon landing on the stigmatic surface. So what do we have? So, so this is a unit stamen, anther filament. In anther, we are having this pollen grains. Okay. So by different pollinators, Okay, they are transferred to the stigmatic surface. Okay, this is the pollen, this is stigmatic, this is the pollen, this is the stigmatic surface. Okay, let me just write it over here. Pollen, this is the stigma. Okay, now, uh, as I mentioned, there is a pollen pistil interaction, a sort of chemical dialogue between these two. And if the plant allows, then pollen tube formation will occur like this. And this pollen tube, pollen tube grows deep to so the style and then it reaches the ovary. Okay, so uh, just a reminder how this pollen tube comes out. Like, this pollen tube contains the inner content of the initial pollen, like, right? They come out through the germ pore because there is no spore pollen present over there. So it can just break through. Now, what does viability mean? So, uh, okay, in wheat and rice, the duration of pollen viability is around, you can say, 30 minutes. And in members of families like Solanaceae, Fabaceae, Rosaceae, you can observe the have viability for many months. Now, what does that mean? It means that, for example, we have a wheat pollen. It falls on the stigmatic surface. So up to a period of 30 minutes only, it has the capacity to produce this pollen tube. Okay. Upon that, it can't produce pollen tube. Okay. So if I have a member of Solanaceae with me and we are conducting poll pollination. So after the pollen, tube, pollen falls on the stigmatic surface, it has a quite significant duration. Like it has many months in its hand. Up to that point, it can form this pollen tube beyond which it won't be able to do that. Okay, so th this means viability. So the pollen it is landing on the stigmatic surface. So for up, up to a certain period of time, it has the capacity to produce a pollen tube. After that, it can't. Okay, so this is pollen viability. The last thing is pollen bank. So here we are storing the pollen grains. Okay, so artificial cryopreservative storage of pollen grains. So the pollen grains are stored in liquid nitrogen. So I guess you must have used uh, this term liquid nitrogen and cryopreservation a lot. Liquid nitrogen is an excellent preservating agent. So the, this pollen grains are stored in liquid nitrogen at around minus 196 degrees Celsius temperature. And they're known as the pollen banks. Okay. So now we are coming to the last part, that is the development of pollen grains before pollination. As I had mentioned, first we are going to study about the structure of the pollen grains. We are going to study, the, uh, study about the different aspects of pollenology, aeropollenology, melisopollenology, archipollenology, bee pollen, pollen bank, pollen viability. Now we are coming to the development of pollen grains before pollination. After that, we are going to get to the structure of ovule. Okay. Now is development of pollen grains. See, just take a look at this. This is a pollen tetrad. Okay. This is not a single pollen. This is a pollen tetrad. You can just check out your NCRT for all these diagrams. Okay. In NCRT, the diagrams have been given very nicely in a very detailed manner. You can use them. But uh, in spite of that, I'm just going to draw them for a better understanding. So we are having a single pollen over here. This is the, this is the pollen membrane. This is the cytoplasm. This is the nucleus. So what happens? Vacuolation occurs. What is vacuolation? Development of vacuoles. So this is what happens. Next, what happens? Formation of asymmetric spindle occurs. I guess you have read about the process of uh, cell division, mitosis, meiosis, spindle fiber, and other respective things in the cell division chapter. 
so this we have a large vacuole that is a characteristic of plants in plants we observe lesser number but larger size vacuoles and animals have a greater number but smaller size vacuoles so here we find asymmetric spindle look you have to keep this word in mind okay so we observe asymmetric spindle in case of this pollen grain division okay so let me write it let me use blue ink asymmetric spindle and thereafter what we observe so this an individual pollen they are undergoing asymmetric division uh, so in case of pollen we are observing asymmetric differentiation they are leading to the form of one big vegetative cell this is a vegetative cell another vegetative cell another is a generative cell and they are together constituting our pollen okay so what happens this pollen grain inside the anther okay so this is a pollen grain okay this pollen grain it is undergoing mitotic division okay but you have, we have to remember this is asymmetric division okay so the division in the pollen inside the pollen grain they're dividing the dividing mitotically as in the chromosome number is not decreasing it's just the same but asymmetric division occurs by asymmetric spindle leading to the formation of a vegetative cell and a generative cell okay which are not equal okay how they're different i'm telling you so let's okay about vegetative cell as it is very clearly visible in the diagram this one is a vegetative cell i'm writing vc this is generative cell you're writing gc okay in vegetative cell what do you observe it is larger in size second we observe irregular nucleus you can observe that the in, that the nucleus is not a perfect circle okay irregular nucleus abundant food resources you can clearly observe the cyto, the uh, difference in cytoplasmic content in between the vegetative and the generative cell abundant food reserve and it is this vegetative cell which later converts into tube cell and at last degenerates so giving a rough idea okay okay no first let me complete the generative cell then i will give you what exactly is this pollen tube and what is how this male gametes and stuff okay uh, so we have completed vegetative cell next upon we have for generative cell so as you can observe in this diagram this is a vegetative cell this is a generative cell the generative cell as you did observe it is small in size it floats in the cytoplasm of vegetative cell see it is very interesting point at the generative cell it floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell i'm writing pc okay spindle shaped dense cytoplasm and round nucleus and it is converted into two male gametes so now what exactly happens so uh, we have okay so just just hear me out okay so we have angiosperm okay no sir uh, no in angiosperms in angiosperms we observe sexual reproduction okay uh, you must have studied in detail in the plant kingdom okay so the different classifications in ang angiosperms we have the flowering plants okay so you have the androsium anther filament okay anther and filament the together constitute the stamen which is the unit of the androsium in anther this polar uh, we have the micros uh, the four my like we uh, we studied yesterday about this uh, like we have two lobes and the each lobe having two thecas so total there are four thecas okay so yeah in immature condition it is in that tetrathecas condition and thereafter it gets fused okay this fused microsporangium they are known as a pollen sac they contain the pollen grains like inside them the pollen grains are developing okay so now what happens this pollen grain either in in, in like the for this pollen grain undergoes mitosis okay it undergoes mitosis but you have to keep this in mind that this mitosis is not symmetrical so you are getting a vegetative cell and a generative cell that two are constituting a, like a two celled pollen grain okay but in some plants what we observe that this particular uh, generative cell they undergo further division so in these plants the pollen grain 
is pollinated in the three cell condition. Okay, so let me just read the, the exact inserted line for you guys. In the pollen grains inside the anther, the mitotically divide to form a two cell structure containing the generative cell and the vegetative cell. The vegetative cell is the largest cell, okay, with abundant food reserve, okay. And generative cell, it is smaller in size, it floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell, have dense cytoplasm, round nucleus, and it develops into the two male gametes. Vegetative cell develops into the tube cell. Okay. In 60% of the angiosperm, pollination takes place in this two cell condition. What do we have? Vegetative cell, generative cell. In this two cell condition, the pollen grains are being pollinated. However, in the remaining 40% of the angiosperm, the generative cell further divides to form the two male gametes and the pollination occurs in them in this three cell condition. Okay. So now what, uh, what happens? So we have, I like, if you consider this is a 60% case, we have a two cell condition. Okay. We have the vegetative cell. We have a generative cell. It lands on the, up, like they carried from, by the pollinators from the asantha to the stigma. On the stigmatic surface, we have the pollen pistil interaction. And if the plant says go, it's okay, you're good to go. Then this tube, uh, vegetative cell, they form the tube cell, which forms the pollen tube. And it is through this pollen tube that this generative cell comes along. Okay. Near the ovary, it divides from the two male gametes. Okay. And one of the male gamete combines with the ovum. Okay. And another one, another one combines with secondary nuclei. Okay, we are going to get to that uh, in the next class when we are uh, in the next class when we are going to study about the structure of the megaspore. Uh, I'm just going to try to, uh, you will get an idea about it now. So it is secondary nuclei. That's why it is actually called double fertilization. We are, okay, don't, don't get confused with all these terms. We are going to study about each of these things in detail. Just giving a brief idea. If it's a three cell condition, what happens? We already have the two male gametes and the vegetative cell. It is uh, pollinated. The vegetative cell forms the uh, tube. Okay, the male gametes go through them and they do this double fertilization thing. Okay, so next is microgametogenesis. So what is microgametogenesis? The process. Okay, okay, let me think the blue ink. The process in which the non-motile male gametes are developed inside the pollen grain this division occurs in the pollen grain in the 40 percent case of angiosperm okay this is for this is 40 percent or in pollen tube in 60 percent cases by mitosis okay so a special note point immature male gametophyte that is the pollen grain mature male gametophyte that is the pollen okay so we have completed this part the development of pollen grains before pollination okay so uh, we have the pollen grain it undergoes mitotic division forming the vegetative cell and the generative cell in 60 percent of the angiosperms this pollen grain is pollinated in this particular two cell stage only in the remaining 40%, the generative cell undergoes mitotic division, forming two male gametes. And in these particular angiosperms, the pollen grain is pollinated in this three cell condition. Okay. Upon reaching the stigmatic surface, there is some chemical dialogue. This pollen tube is formed, and the pollen tube takes this particular. In the three cell condition, the two male gametes are taken. In the, 60, uh, in the two cell condition, the generative cell is taken. The generative cell divides. Into, to form the two male gametes and the male gametes undergo double fertilization. One fertilizes the ovum and then the second nuclei. Okay, we're going to read about that next. And now we are coming to the structure of. So, palynology is done. It was an extensive topic. Now we are going to study the structure of ovule. Okay, structure of ovule is a comparatively easy topic. It's not going to be that tough for you. Okay, so let me just uh, read the NCRT for you guys. The gynosium represents the female reproductive part of the plant. You guys already know it. Gynosium may consist of a single pistil, monocapillary, or may have more than one pistil, multicapillary. Go, uh, do read the examples of this from the morphology of flowering plants chapter. Okay. In uh, when there are more than one pistils, they may be fused together, syncarpus, or not fused together, or like that is free apocarpus. In syncarpus, they are fused. Apocarpus, they are free. If pistil has three parts. Okay. So now here we get to go. That is, we are now setting of the gynosium. So it's single unit. 
is pistol. Okay. So now the pistol has three parts. There's a stigma, style, and ovary. Okay. This is an average rough structure. You can see this is a stigma. This is a style. This is the ovary containing the ovules. Okay. Okay. Uh, so just let me do one thing. Let me first cover this part. Uh, I would require a whole new page. So instead of structure of ovule, uh, let me cover the development of ovule. So once I cover up this development of ovule, the next class I would be able to cover structure of ovule and it's going to be easier for you to understand that part. So today I'm going to complete this development of ovule part. Mm -hmm. Wait a second. Uh, uh, you guys noted this down, so I'm erasing it. Okay, because I will be requiring the two slides to cover this development of ovule part. You guys must have noted it down. It's very easy. It's you, you guys out to know it from your prior classes in like nine and ten knowledge. Hmm. Okay, so it is development of ovule, like we are studied the same in anther in case of anther. Like from anther initials, we observed how the mitosis it from all the layers the epidermis, endothelium, middle layer, stapetum, sporogenous tissue. And then we at last we observed there was only one meiosis in this whole process where the microspore mother cells by meiosis form the microspore. Okay. So if we have it is ovule initials, they are two one. They are forming one is the outer layer, inner layer. Or archisporial cells, same, right? It's the, it's the same for answer initials as well. So both are 2n, 2n, 2n. So this division has to be mitosis, equational division. This outer layer undergoes mitosis, forming integument. What is integument? I'm going to cover in the next class. Integument is 2n. Next, this forms primary parietal cell and this uh, forms primary sporogenous cells 2n 2n <sighs> okay so this primary parietal cells from secondary parietal cells i'm just writing pc okay you can understand this process is also mitosis over here you're also observing mitosis and via mitosis they form the new cells. This is also 2N. And uh, they form the secondary sporogenous tissue. Sporogenous cells, okay, this is 2N. Okay, let me just go to the next slide. So we had the secondary sporogenous cells. They undergo mitosis. Okay. They undergo mitosis. From in the megaspore mother cell, which undergoes meiosis to form megaspore tetrad. So now, okay, so let's just come, uh, focus on this part as well. So this thing in, uh, in the previous, uh, like in case of anther, we had microsporogenesis. Microspore mother cell undergoing meiosis forming microspore tetrad. There was microsporogenesis. So this happens the same thing over here. The megaspore mother cell undergoing meiosis forming megaspore tetrads. This is going to be megasporogenesis. This is just a fancy name for this. Megasporogenesis. So in the next class, I'm going to cover the structure of this uh, whole stigma style ovary. I'm going to cover the whole structure of pistil. Okay, I'm going to cover the structure of ovule. Like Then we get to understand the meaning of all this integument, new cellars, and all the other things. Okay. I'm going to cover that. I'm going to cover types of, uh, first, I'm going to cover structure of ovule. Uh, I, I will give a brief idea of the structure of stigma style and their respective functions. Okay, as well. Then I'll cover the structure of ovule. Then I'll cover the types of ovule. Okay. The next, uh, I've covered this development of ovule. So the next, I will get in the process of megasporogenesis. Okay. And Okay, so let me just uh, give a okay, uh, a kind of a recap you might say. So what happens is exactly 
Mm, okay. Okay. I will just cover it in this part. So in microsporogenesis, uh, in microsporogenesis, okay, I'm getting back to androgen. Okay. What happens is you have uh, like there are four thekas right in the in the majority right. Uh, apart from Malvasi family, remember in Malvasi we had uh, di uh, bithecus condition. Upon fuse we become monothecus. Apart from that, in other families we have tetrathecus condition. Okay. So now they are getting fused. Okay. And in each of them, like the fused microsporin engine, they are the pollen sac. Okay. In them, what is happening? This the what they, this porogenous cells, they're essentially the microsperm mother cells. Okay. This porogenous cells, they are actually the microsperm mother cells and they are undergoing microsporogenesis forming microspore tetrad. And now each microspore tetrad, they are forming a pollen grain. And thereafter, we are uh, going to the respective developmental stages of the pollen grain. Okay. So, you know, just clear the concept. Sporogenous cells, each sporogenous cell is forming a, uh, is forming a microsperm mother cell. This microsperm mother cell is undergoing microsporogenesis forming microspore tetrad. Okay. Each micros each member of the microspore tetrad is forming a pollen grain. So here we are like, so in microsporogenesis, what do we observe? That so uh, microspore tetrad, each member of it is forming a pollen grain. But in case of the female counterpart, in megasporogenesis, we are getting the megaspore tetrad, but what we will observe at three of them gets degenerated and only one pertains and it goes into the respective next developmental stage. Okay. So this is, you know, kind of a heads up for the next class. Okay. This like this uh, sexual reproduction flowering plants is an extremely interesting chapter. And I'm uh, like, I will try to cover all this chapter in due proper time with cover, like while covering all the topics with proper notes and diagrams and stuff. So just continue being with me, attend the classes regularly, do follow NCRT. And uh, about the class notes and question and some practice questions, I'm going to send them today. So like this class and previous classes, I'm going to send total lecture notes as well as the, some practice questions for you guys. Okay. Thank you. Continue keep studying. All the very best.